If there are two words that are guaranteed to make a medical student go pale and sweaty in a viva, it has to be... Now, the brachial plexus has caused much confusion for students for centuries. There is a traditional way to learn the brachial plexus, which is to learn the roots, the trunks, the divisions, and the chords, which incidentally can be remembered with a mnemonic read the details carefully, read R for roots, the T for trunk, details D for divisions, and carefully C for chords. But I think when you're starting out learning the brachial plexus, it's probably more useful to just get a handle of the nerves and have a rough idea of the muscles that they supply. And once you familiarize yourself with the names of the nerves, then you can go back to learning the detail. So in this unconventional tutorial, I'm going to teach you the nerves of the upper limb. So let's start at the back. Let's look for associations, and I tend to group muscles together. So if we turn to the back of the body, or the back of the trunk, or the dorsal aspect of the trunk, there are two important nerves you need to learn here. And because we're in the dorsal aspect of the trunk, fortunately both these nerves have the word dorsal in them. First up is the dorsal scapular nerve. Now this is at the upper part of the trunk, and unsurprisingly there are three muscles here that attach to the back of the scapula. From top down, these are levator scapulae, rhomboid minor, and rhomboid major. So this is the dorsal scapula nerve. Moving slightly further down the trunk, there's one big, broad muscle, the latissimus dorsi, and this has a single nerve supply. And again, it has the words trunk and dorsal in it. It's the thoracodorsal nerve. So what could be easier? Now moving round the trunk to the side, there's a muscle that literally wraps itself around the ribs or wraps itself around the side of the thoracic cage. And this nerve also has the word thoracic in it. It's the muscle is serratus anterior and the nerve is the long thoracic nerve of Bell. And you may well ask yourself, who was Bell? Well, it's actually named after Sir Charles Bell, who in 1824 became the first professor of anatomy at the Royal College of Surgeons of England. So now if we move to the front of the trunk, there's a big muscle on the front, the pectoralis major. So if you think pectoralis major, always think pectoralis minor. Now these two muscles are supplied by two nerves that both have the word pectoral in them. They are in fact the lateral pectoral nerve and the medial pectoral nerve. Now before we strip away these superficial muscles, there's always one muscle that gets forgotten, and that is the subclavius. And the nerve to the subclavius is in fact called the nerve to subclavius. So an easy one to remember, but it always gets forgotten. So if we move round to the back of the trunk again and strip away the superficial muscles, we get down to the rotator cuff muscles. Now on the back or the dorsal aspect of the scapula, there are two muscles, the supraspinatus above the spine of the scapula and the infraspinatus below the spine of the scapula. And these are supplied by the same nerve, the suprascapular nerve. In front of the scapula is subscapularis, and this is a big powerful muscle, so big and so powerful in fact that it has two nerves that supply it, the upper and the lower subscapular nerves. And the lower subscapular nerve actually supplies another muscle, and this muscle is the teres major. And you may find that unusual and think, why is it doing that? But if you look at the position of the muscles, you'll notice that teres major actually runs directly below subscapularis. So it kind of makes sense. Now, moving on to the arm, I'm quite excited about this one, because the nerves that supply the arm spell the word arm. I oh, know, brilliant. Doesn't happen often, but when it does, great. A is for auxiliary, which supplies a deltoid, which gives the shoulder that lovely rounded shape. It also actually supplies teres minor, which is the fourth rotator cuff muscle that we haven't mentioned yet. R in arm is for radial, which supplies the posterior compartment, which is the triceps. And M is for the anterior compartment, which is supplied by the musculocutaneous nerve. Now moving on to the forearm, there are three major nerves that supply the forearm, and these spell the mnemonic RUM. R for radial, which supplies the extensor or posterior compartment. U for ulna, which supplies the most medial flexors, that is flexor carpi ulnaris, and the medial half of flexor digitorum profundus. 
and the M is for the median nerve. Now the median nerve supplies all of the other flexors in the forearm and it supplies the loaf muscles. The rest of the muscles in the hand are supplied by the ulnar nerve. Now if you want to find out what each of these nerves do individually you're going to have to go to the other podcasts but here's a little teaser. I have a few little memory joggers to help you remember what each nerve does. So for the ulnar nerve I think of two words. I think of medial and I think of hand. Medial because it travels down the medial aspects of the upper limb and it supplies the most medial flexors in both the superficial and deep compartment. And I think of hand because it supplies all the intrinsic muscles of the hand except for loaf, which brings me on to the median nerve. When I think of the median nerve, I think of two words. I think of flex and loaf. Flex because it supplies all the other flexors in the forearm and loaf because it supplies the loaf muscles, which are the lateral two lumbricals, opponens pollicis, abductor pollicis brevis, and flexor pollicis brevis. And finally, for the radial nerve, I think of three words for this one. I think of radiating, I think of extending, and I think of posterior. Radiating because the radial nerve supplies all the muscles and the posterior aspects of the upper limb, extending because these are the muscles that extend the forearm and the wrist and posterior because it supplies all of the muscles in the posterior compartment of the arm and the posterior compartment of the forearm and it supplies the skin on the posterior aspect of the arm, forearm and hand. So there you have it, a slightly unusual way of looking at the brachial plexus but I think this is quite useful when you're starting out. Let me know what you think.